uh, bestowed to unworthy sinners. We know that we could never merit your favor. And so, Lord, do uh, you constantly magnify your grace uh, upon grace. Be- meet with your church as we study your word, which is inerrant, infallible. It's uh, sufficient to answer the issues of life so that we could live life in a way that puts you, you and your work on display. We give you much praise for your spirit and your truth. Help us to adore Christ more through our time together. For It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right. Is my mic on? Oh, great. And uh, is our clicker working? Hey, great. Well, take your Bibles, and I want you to run to two places. Put your fingers there, and we'll get there in just a second. 1 Timothy 2.9 and 1 Peter 3.3. 3. First text, 1 Timothy 2.9, and the second one is 1 Peter 3.3. 3. We want to look at the heart of modesty. It was the Baptist London preacher Spurgeon, very insightful in pointing out the irony of how men fight against God with God's own gifts. A woman endowed with beauty, the rare gift of God, uses it to ensnare others into sin. God gives us garments, and there are some who use their very garments for nothing else but pride and who go through the world with no motive but display, unquote. Friends, probably no teaching of Scripture more confronts the spirit of our age, the highly sexualized culture, than that of Christian modesty. How we dress is a barometer of where our heart is at, And so in midweek Bible study today, the heart of modesty, we want to seek to equip the saints on how to think about shepherding and discipling and parenting, even grandparenting, uh, those entrusted to our care and looking at our own hearts so that the church can be an island of righteousness in this rank sea of paganism all around us. As recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we desire to be signposts that point to Christ rather than self. So I asked you to turn to a couple of passages. The first one, 1 Timothy 2.9, we'll, uh, we'll weave these verses through our lesson tonight, constantly thinking of them. 1 Timothy 2.9, Paul says to his disciple Timothy, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, with modesty and self-restraint, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly clothing. Now, don't read into the verse what isn't there. Uh, don't make more of it than, than what's there. He's, he's not railing against prettying yourself up. As I was told in church as a young man growing up at the barn doors, need paint and paint them. And so he's not railing against uh, uh, jewelry and uh, proper outward attire, but what is proper and fitting. Modesty is something that our age despises and uh, works against. We want to look at that together tonight. And even though he specifies women and how they adorn themselves, that doesn't neglect the man. As we're going to mention later on, this is not uh, uh, a respecter of gender. You know, when you go to various passages of Scripture that are specifically speaking about one issue, it's applied in in many other ways. Say in uh, verses on marriage, and the husband is being focused on or the wife, well, many times it's the other spouse as well. And so even though Paul says to Timothy in regards to women how they adorn themselves, it's not that he lets the men off the hook. 1 Peter 3.3, 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on garments. The Christian concerns themselves with their garments. Are we adorned in the gospel of Jesus, not just at a heart level, but exterior as well, the exterior representing the interior? 
maybe it would be best to think through for just a moment this present evil age. We do live in a highly sexualized culture that acts as though it cannot get enough of that which is provocative. Yesterday, I just blew some debris off my deck getting ready for today's rain. I was making sure to cover all the, the dry firewood and blow all the crud off the, off the deck. And it's amazing how the big oak tree that shades our picture window realizes that we're going into fall even though it's been hot because I had scores of leaves to blow off. So as I was getting ready... The tree knows what's just around the corner. We've just finished up the summer months and kids are back in school, whether you homeschool or public school or Christian school them. Uh, summer months do bring out a special difficulty in our lives as islands of righteousness in the sea of paganism all around us, does it not? This universal struggle with sex and sexuality and temptation. Many in our church family just returned from the top tropical region of Puerto Rico and all the beaches there. And uh, I remember when my daughters that are not so little anymore, when we left the concrete jungle of Southern Cal, the, uh, the billboard land, I couldn't wait to get away from the city billboards. We couldn't even find a modest bathing suit for our girls. We always had to order them. But too much skin isn't just an issue of beaches and pools. How about porn? The most lucrative and largest industry on the internet. And it's the most oft-used marketing approach when selling products to our culture. Sex sells everything, and they put a sexual spin to it. Depravity takes what God has created pure and pollutes something that God creates good and turning into something to tantalize our lust-filled desires. So as we think through the present evil age, let me call to focus in our thinking Demas. In uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, no need to turn there. It's a, it's a very short verse. Paul says that Demas, having loved this present age, not the world, but the system of the world, this, this age, he said, Demas has deserted me. You know, Demas had been one of Paul's closest associates along with Luke and Epaphras, but was in love with the present system. Perhaps you would jot down James 4.4. 4. James tells us in James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. So James uses the terminology of friendship with the world, this present age, this, this worldly system all around us. John goes past the friendship level to a, a love level in uh, if you wanted to jot another passage down, it'd be 1 John 2 in John's first epistle, chapter 2 and verse 15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also its lusts but the one who does the will of God abides forever. John teaches us very clearly uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boast of pride of life. These are the, the, the ways that the adversary, Satan, the tempter, the tantalizer, has constantly used to tempt mankind throughout the ages. Love for the world and love for self are tied at the hip. Love of self whether it's the stay-at-home mom with her serial posts on social media of the latest hairstyles to all of her followers and hoping that they're tracking with her of these, these great designs, or the triple X pornographer, the neon sign constantly pointing to me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, 
love for self, love for the world. I think I mentioned in the introduction of our lesson, lust and modesty are not respecters of a certain gender, but is common to both. Uh, I, I think often in our thinking, sometimes in our speech, we kind of broad brush in our thinking that lust is a male vice and modesty or lack thereof is a female issue. But both of them are for both genders, okay? Uh, these are vices that we must flee from. And uh, maybe to help us get over that hurdle, go back to Matthew 7 for a moment. You know, we can, we can see others' sins with 2020 vision, but we can't see quite so clearly our own sin issues, right? Uh, Matthew 7, verse number 3. Jesus asks, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And what's this look like? Well, you, you got the hypocritical man saying, well, if she wouldn't dress that way, I wouldn't lust so bad. No, brother, you've got a lustful heart. Jesus tells us that in the Sermon on the Mount. Some men indeed lust at any female, any time, for any reason, regardless of how modest she might be. It's just because she's breathing and walking upright. Yes, Jesus commands the believer to take radical action with sin, Matthew 5, 29 and 30. If, if you've got the lustful brother, he said, you better be willing to pluck out your eyeball. Hi, this is hy hyperbole. He's speaking over the top. He's not telling you to gouge out your literal eyeball, but he's willing to take that radical action with indwelling sin. Yes, God gave men the desire to notice the opposite sex and be attracted to her beauty. Notice the words I've intentionally used. Notice and attraction. But Satan twisted and man's affections were twisted in the fall so they didn't just notice God-given beauty, does he? He lusts after it. Christian men are commanded to rule over it and every provision has been given to us through the Spirit and the Scriptures. So since the issue of modesty and the issue of lust and our sexualized culture is not specific to one gender, men have sin issues here and so do women. Women too took what God's given, God-given gifts that are good and turn to her version of perversion. Who's the author of beauty? God is. But rather than pointing to him, many times she keeps it to herself. Just look at social media platforms again in your thinking. She wants man to look at her, to like her, to love her, so she uses it to capture his gaze and fill her heart longings that only the Lord can fulfill, not the man that lusts after her. So I guess the issue that we're driving at is that we are signposts. And we're signposts either pointing to Jesus or pointing to self. How you present the beauty of Christ externally to others is just as important as how you carry the beauty of Christ in your heart. External life shows what's growing in the heart. From the Gospel of Matthew, go to Luke's Gospel for a second. Luke 6, 45. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Our master teacher, the Lord Jesus, says the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from the abundance of his heart. So what drives our tongue? Our hearts do. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
in uh, Matthew's parallel passage in Matthew 7, 16 that I think I referenced on the slide here. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. Our fruit indicates our heart. We can't see one another's hearts, but given enough fruit, you can make a good speculated guess and talk to each other about where our hearts are. So to say that is to say that there's no disconnectedness between how a lady paints her face or presents their latest hairstyle, what she wears, and what's going on in her heart. Same for the men. Jesus says, by their fruits you shall know them. Fruit in our lives reveals our choices, which reveals our beliefs, revealing our motives, and thus what we think about God. So to say that, you could also say, show me a person's fruit, and I'll tell you how he or she thinks about God, based upon our outward behavior. Let me use this uh, example to paint a picture. One uh, biblical counseling friend, I, I, I got a resource section towards the end of the PowerPoint, and uh, Rick Thomas runs a blog called uh, Life Over Coffee. Coffee's a good thing. This is the nectar of the gods, which keeps us, keeps us going. Um, and Rick says, you know, a few years ago, Lucia, which is his wife, we were at a small group where a woman, a wife and mother, wore mini shorts with all caps, the word pink written across her bottom, and I, I, I think that some of you have seen those, that kind of attire that's out there. He said it was impossible for anyone at Bible study not to look at least once, and it mattered not if you were male or female, child or adult. She was a provocative signpost, that's the title of our slide, telling everyone in the room to look at her backside. Her message could not have been clearer, hey y'all, look at my bum. She reminded me of men who wear hyperbolic belt buckles that draw attention to their crotches. You know, if, you, if we were in Texas, you know, the big belt buckles, there's a reason why many times people wear those. Anyway, sadly, this, this lady was new to our group. Nobody knew her well enough to pull her aside and talk to her about the neon ad wear it was an awkward moment for all of us, and in hindsight, perhaps we should have offended her, but we chose not to. We uh, started our study percolating on 1 Peter 3, did we not? Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of clothing, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. First Peter 3 was one of our cross-references Sunday as we looked at this Christian virtue of Christian gentleness. Well, this gal at Bible study, Rick says, accomplished her agenda. Every eye in the place, including the women and children, got a screenshot of her rear end, something you could not unsee. Rather than drawing attention to the Lord, she was drawing attention to herself. She is one of a zillion examples of women who dress in such a way not only to devalue themselves, but also to take away from the imperishable beauty that the Apostle Peter extolled. She chose to praise herself, unlike John the Baptist, who considered himself a signpost in the wilderness with one mission in life. What was John's mission? To point others to Christ. When you see a sign, you read it. You process it, and you do what it's telling you to do. You do not give the sign a second thought. It's not about the sign, but the message. We got one job, point people to Jesus. I've told you from behind the sacred desk here before, when we go out and do evangelism at the farmer's markets, we've got gospel tracts in our pockets, and we've got gospel signs, because those that won't take a gospel tract, they can't unsee the verses of Scripture on the sign, right? It's the same principle. We want to leave the message of the gospel in their mind, not visions of self. John said in John 3.28, 
I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah. The signpost knows its job. Unfortunately, this lady was a self-absorbed signpost whose primary interest was to redirect the minds of the men in the room from the Christ she professed to her bottom that she was proud of. If a woman dresses in such a way as to draw attention to herself, she's tempting those around her to sin. If the man does sin, whose fault is it? It's his fault for his sinning. But the woman bears culpability as well. She needs to know how she's a temptress, assuming she does not already know. And you might think uh, Rick's uh, language is too over the top by calling her a temptress. Uh, one of the ladies' Bible studies I thoroughly recommend, Martha Pease is a Christian author, a biblical counselor, and uh, she uses a similar terminology in an article on uh, modesty at the pool and the beaches. Uh, she calls this lady a harlot in the head. So head harlots who dress sensually. We must be talking about this social contagion while humbly dialoguing about God-centered solutions. It's not suitable for a man to place all the blame on the woman. It's just as wrong for a woman to make this exclusively a man's problem. Like I said, modesty and lust are not gender respective. John said, he must increase, I must decrease. We as followers of the Lord Jesus have one job to do as gospel signposts pointing others to our Savior. And before we go much further, let me give a quick word to parents before I forget to say it. Now, there's a lot to say to parents, but I wanted to make sure to include it real quickly. Number one, talk about modesty all the time with your young people. It includes dressing modestly all the time, even at home, each member of the family. And you might think that that's patently obvious. Uh, that's a given. It's an assumption because it gives opportunity to talk about the godliness of modesty, the godliness of being covered up. It's a way to express care to others. But I want to hasten to say that this is not a, an assumption we can make. It's not assumed. Maybe I, I probably shouldn't have been shocked, but years ago when I was counseling a, a pastor, I, I think, well, a pastor surely should know better, ought to know about modesty, not just outside the home, but in the home, and he did not work hard at home to maintain the post-fall shame that's been attached to nakedness. And that's our duty as parents. Talk about it all the time. Second of all, answer your kids' questions as best you can when they, when they come up. Gone are the good old days when you could wait till your kids to turn double digits, 10, 12, 14, where we held all the cards regarding sex information in a time that culture valued modesty more than it does in 2024. But these, I don't care if you want to talk about the, the, the evil smart devices that make it readily available, and it's everywhere from billboards to all the ads on television and games, all the things, just the pop-ups. You know, when, you're, when your kid asks the question, what's pornography? You know, I, I remember when, I, now it would be my eldest, uh, is in Sunday school, and they were going through the book of Romans in, in Sunday school, and... Paul talks about circumcision. Daddy, what's circumcision? And if we didn't have the habit of having constant talks, because I'm a parent that doesn't believe in having the talk, you know, the birds and the bee talk, it's called relationship. There's a lot of talks. And that's just what I'm encouraging here. You know, when your kid asks, what's pornography? You can simply say it's people getting immodest and taking pictures of it. That's enough for a six-year-old as they scratch their head and they ask you, but dad, mom, why would they do that? Because well, this is the sinful world we live in. But what that does is it starts developing relationship and understanding that, you know what? 
Dad's going to shoot straight with me when I got those questions about life. They're not just going to say, well, later on sometime. We need to be thinking through these issues. How we shepherd, how we disciple, how we parent, and yes, even how we grandparent because the job is never done. You know, as you, you think about the heart of modesty with me, let me uh, use il- this illustration. We're coming up to elections real quick here. We're less than two months away. I haven't counted the weeks yet. But during a previous administration, there were signs posted on the doors at the White House in D.C. listing inappropriate summer attire for work. What was on the list? Glad you asked. Shorts, halter tops, T-shirts, tennis shoes, flip-flops, sundresses, and strapless dresses. This is in a secular institution, not the church. And yes, you see most of these in churches in the summer of our day, unfortunately. Anyways, that particular president set the tone for what was appropriate to wear at work. This particular president, unlike other casual presidents, wore a suit every day he was in the Oval Office and he expected professional attire to be worn by his staff as well. He set the bar, he set a standard. It's easier to go down, but he wanted to raise people up to that standard. He believed that the setting demanded a certain level of respect. I, I think, friends, this brings up the whole issue of decorum. Does it not? You know, the church has standards for what's appropriate dress in specific circumstances. Uh, Shepherd's Conference that some of us like to go to every summer, it opened up, was it yesterday or the day before? Yesterday? It was only open for a few hours before they sold out. You go to Shepherd's Conference and they've got, uh, they ask you to wear business casual and the First, the person that's never been to Shepcon, the, one of the first questions that comes out of people's lips is, what's business casual? <laughs> you know, I've even asked guys here, if you, you read scripture on the platform, at least wear a college shirt. Uh, we're done with this casual Christianity. It's easier to, we'd, we'd rather bring people up to a higher standard. If this particular president that I mentioned were coming to Talent, Oregon, we're not going to be coming in casual attire. Why do you take a hat off in church? Why do you take your hat off for prayer? I, I was on a, uh, a video conference yesterday with some important friends, and I hadn't had time to get a shower yet, so what did I do? I stuck a hat on, and even when they opened the Zoom session with prayer, what did I do? I took my hat off, because that's appropriate. I'd rather they see me with disheveled, greasy hair than not showing respect to my Lord that we're going to in prayer. Why do, why do, why, or I should say, I, I was going to say, why do men? I, I ought to say, why did men used to take hats off in front of ladies? Decorum, respect, it's appropriate. You, know, you wouldn't go to the finest restaurant in the Rogue Valley and be belching loudly, would you? Just out of place. When you go to a funeral, Most people wear something somber and dark to reflect a heart of sorrow. 2 Samuel 3.31. You go to a wedding. Attire reflects a joyful heart as a celebration is underway. I was interacting with a fellow female biblical counselor who assures that many a woman would tell you how she feels in the morn in the morning is what dictates her attire. How we, how we feel is related to how we think and believe about something. Back in 1 Samuel 16, actually before I get that, I think I'd forgotten to flip the slide, didn't, didn't I? Uh, let, let me mention modesty is an issue of the heart behind the selection of the clothes. What we wear is a revelation of what is going on inside in the inner man. Our thoughts, our beliefs, our desires all take place 
in the heart. This is a, the heart of man is a religious place. 1 Samuel 16, 7. I wanted to turn there, back there with me. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Back where in some of your Bibles the pages might be stuck together. We need to unstick them. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But Yahweh said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. Let's stop for a moment and set the context. The prophet has already been looking for who God had as the next king because Saul had disqualified himself. Who looks like a king? And Samuel's going around and like, is this all you've got for future kings? And this young shepherd boy comes out and he's, he's, Samuel's kind of scratching his head. That's why God says to him, don't look at his appearance his outward appearance, or at the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. Part of our humanness is we make judgment calls based on what we see, not on what we can't see. Only God can see man's heart. Yet clothes can be a window into one's character You know, as you think about First First Samuel sixteen seven, that means what goes on inside is what God's most concerned about. That's what He sees: issues of the heart, not just the deeds of our hands. That's what Jesus gets at in the Sermon on the Mount. One who's declared righteous, whose heart has been changed, who performs righteous practices, deeds of righteousness, but where do those deeds of righteousness come from? They come from a righteous heart. It's been changed. Unfortunately, we're so dependent, even deluded on physical eyesight. You, you take this world around us. The secular worldview sees man as a hunk of flesh. It's, it's a body. You go to the doctor and he can doctor the body, but he can't doctor the soul. They don't admit to the soul. The Bible reveals that man is body and soul. He's material and immaterial. The biblical worldview that's informed by the revelation of Scripture sees us at least as two-part body and soul. So we've got to constantly go back to the unseen, setting our minds on things above, not what we observe. Let me illustrate it this way. We tend to think that a person who is well-dressed in expensive clothes is blessed and well-to-do, even somehow spiritually superior to a person with tattered, ill-fitting clothes. And yet a less physically polished person could be a spiritual giant and be living a life of sacrifice for the sake of others. Uh, James picks up on this point in James 2, 1 to 5. He talks about how that when people come into the congregation and somebody is well-dressed, you say, hey, come sit up here. It's a judgment call. The eye of faith wonders who the unseen spiritual giants are among us. Conversely, what a person wears can be a reflection of their spiritual life and condition. Notice halfway down your, uh, your slide, clothes can be a window into one's character for the scantily clad woman reveals much of her heart. Various verses there attesting to that. You know, in uh, the Mosaic Law, man was forbidden from wearing women's clothes and vice versa. Why? Men are to look like men and women are to look like women. You don't find women with a long beard, you find them with long hair, right? 
I won't get into Spurgeon's view of the godliness of a beard. We'll save that for another time. Go to Proverbs 7.10 if you would. Since we are doing scripture readings right now as a congregation through Proverbs, we just finished chapter 6. And so, so we're reading from chapter 7, which we'll be reading from several verses on Sunday. Proverbs 7 and verse number 10. Solomon says to his son, And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. How do you know she's cunning of heart? She's dressed as a harlot. How's a harlot dressed? You know how a harlot dressed. We don't need to get into the details here. We want to paint any pictures before your eyes. Clothing sends a nonverbal message about you. Whether it be the professional dressing the part, like an executive or a pastor. Have you read some of the articles that talk about uh, when somebody goes to the doctor, if the doctor's being too casual and doesn't have his white doctor's coat on, but just by the presence of a doctor with his coat on, people feel better. You know what you're talking about because you look the part. There's something to it. A woman who dresses like a harlot that Solomon talks about in Proverbs 7, clothes that are too tight, skirts too short, tops too skimpy. She's revealing an aspect of her character that is lacking, glaringly lacking. It tells others that you see what you think about yourself and about your body. Or do they see one who values the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, temple of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, what many young women, or even older ones for that matter, see as being comfortable or being fashionable or real chic are revealing hard attitudes and character flaws. Because the standard is not, well, I almost said GQ magazine, but that's for a man, right? Uh, whatever the feminine parallel to that would be. The standard's holiness. It's glorifying God. It's loving neighbor, as we'll look at in a moment. Let me give a little footnote here on comfort. I was uh, reading a Truth and Love podcast by ACBC. You said, how do you read a podcast which is audible? Because you can find the transcripts as well. And uh, former executive director Heath Lambert was dialoguing with Martha Pease that I've already mentioned and uh, in this article, uh, or this blog article on uh, being modest at the pool and at the beaches, she supposes some object objections that she's heard and that we've heard. One objection, hey, we need to wear modest swimming attire. And the objection is, well, I want to be comfortable at the pool. I want to be comfortable at the beach. And this, this two-piece, this, this bikini is just more comfortable so hot outside. Martha responds, well, I think if you really want to be comfortable, you just want to go naked. I mean, that's even better. So if the bathing suit is big enough for them, they'll be going comfortable. I just want to be comfortable in God's eyes, not man's eyes. So what is our standard for making our choices? Heath says, okay, that's great. All right, here's another objection. I looked all over the place. I can't find a one piece that fits or I can't find a one piece that really looks good on me. Martha says, well then, you just don't go swimming. It's not worth sing singing against God. You just have to keep looking. That's all I know to say. Dr. Lambert says that's good. So keep looking. Maybe you haven't looked hard enough. And if you really, really can't find one, it'd be better not to go swimming than to sin against the Lord. So what are our convictions? Many times the clothing choices that have been made reveal a prideful and lustful heart, a desire to be noticed. Julie Ganshaw, biblical counselor of women, said your clothes should not be distracting to those who have gathered to worship. This has been one of her frustration points in ministry. I've been in 
church services over the years where a young woman has distracted the preacher as he was delivering his sermon as she walked to the back of the auditorium it's inappropriate to wear short skirts and plunging necklines to worship church is a place that requires a certain level of reverence and respect to determine to do otherwise is out of spirit of wearing what i please quote unquote it's an indication of a prideful and idolatrous heart when you go to church for corporate worship You're not there to please yourself. You're coming into the presence of God with fellow Christians for the purpose of singing praises to God and learning from His Word for the purpose of worship. Think about these things, women of God, and determine to worship Him in your heart first and let your clothing be a reflection of the Christ-like life within you. Yes, I'd have to go back about three decades to think about when I was a youth pastor. And if my bride were here tonight, she could affirm to you, long before kids... I was just this young 20-some-odd-year-old youth pastor, and front row, you got a young teenage lady with a short skirt, and it's like, honey, can you start sitting next to her because I'm not going to even look at her because it's not healthy for me as her pastor. You see, friends, we're, we're looking at this, this lost virtue of Christian and biblical modesty, Dr. Kevin DeYoung was sharing some helpful thoughts, and though he struggled as to whether the modest way is the hottest way, it is the biblical way. We must clearly state and affirm that God considers modesty a virtue and is opposite a vice. And here's why. Number one, modesty protects what is what is intimate. There's a certain strand of feminism which says women should be proud of their sexual prowess and that any insistence that they cover up what they don't feel like covering up only serves to reinforce patriarchal notions that men have the right to determine what women do with their bodies. But the Bible calls to modesty is not based on the supposed naughtiness of the female form. It is God's good command to cover up. It's not meant to punish, but to protect. Wendy Shallot writes, quote, the pressure on girls today to take sexy selfies comes out of a culture or our age that routinely equates modesty with shame instead of recognizing it for what it really is, an impulse that protects what is precious and intimate, unquote. When's the last time, dear friends, that you read Song of Solomon? The common refrain of the bride is do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Song of Solomon 2.7. It's a call from one woman to a group of single women to save sexual arousal and sexual activity for its proper time with its proper person in the proper place. Biblical decorum. Modesty protects what is intimate. Number two, modesty accepts that our bodies also live in community. We were not created to live in and of and for our own selves. It sounds nice to say it's my body, but if I don't want to let it all hang out, that's my business. That's to forget that our bodies exist in a wider network of relationships, just like our speech does, our actions, our wills, our desires. How we dress is not determined by how others wished we would dress, and yet it would be sub-Christian to act as if the spiritual state of those around us was inconsequential. You know, before going any further, let me state this as clearly as possible. Men going back to the gender thing, men are responsible for their adultery, for their fornication, for their pornographic viewing, for their lust, and for, heaven forbid, sexual assault, regardless of how a woman dresses. The Bible does not enjoin modesty on either sex because the opposite sex is simply incapable of keeping its pants on and its thoughts in check. Men... 
If Potiphar's wife were to barge in and dance a bare-bellied jig on your kitchen table and strip you down to your birthday suit like she did Joseph, you still would not be excused in committing adultery with her. The absence of modesty in one party does not justify the absence of restraint on the other party. Having said that, if we're clear, does not the law of love suggest that we should want to avoid enticing others into sin, being a stumbling block? The phrase with lustful intent of Matthew 5, 28 is translated by some scholars, D.A. Carson, New Testament scholar among them, so as to get her lust. The meaning then, instead of being about lust in the man's heart, would be about the man wanting to get a woman to lust after him. So whether you accept the minority position, which I'm not convinced I do, it's still a fair application to think that Jesus' statement forbids us from having a heart attitude that lusts and a heart attitude that wants to be lusted after. Look at me. Some people want to see pornography and others want to be pornography. Maybe not in a literal sense, but there are men and women who crave the power, the attention, the status that comes from being noticed and sought after. This entices others to sin and is itself sinful. Number three, modesty operates with the Bible's negative assessment of public nudity post-fall. Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3, and they quickly scrambled for fig leaves. Verse 10. To the, you, you move from that later on in Genesis to Genesis 9.21, the nakedness of Noah, to the embarrassingly exposed buttocks of David's men of 2 Samuel 10.4. The Bible knows we inhabit a fallen world in which certain aspects of our bodily selves are meant to be hidden. Indeed, this is precisely what Paul presumes when he speaks about our unpresentable parts which must be treated with greater modesty, 1 Corinthians 12, 23. Isn't that the reason why mama called them private parts? Because they're what? They're private. Number four. Modesty embraces the the strong biblical admonition to refrain from sensuality. Sensuality is a key to the world all around us, the age that we live in. That term sensuality, asilgeia, is a distinguishing characteristic of the flesh and one of the marks of the pagan world, whether it be Galatians 5.19, Romans 13.13, 2 Corinthians 12.21, or 2 Peter 2.2. Well, does that word sensuality give us the exact instructions on where good taste trips over into sensuality, how long your your skirts can be, for instance, or what sort of bathing suit to wear, or, or whether beefy men need to run around shirtless when it's 60 degrees around here? No. But surely we can agree that it's not uncommon for men and women to dress in ways which only add to the look and feel of our culture's ubiquitous sensuality. If that word, asalgeia, sensuality, suggests sexual excess, we'd do well to consider whether the desire behind our deportment is to starve the sensual beast within or to satiate it, fill it full. Fifth and finally, modesty demonstrates to others that we have more important things to offer than good looks and sex appeal. What is the point of 1 Timothy 2.9 and 1 Peter 3.3 3 and 4? It's not an absolute prohibition against trying to look nice. Like I said earlier, the barn doors need paint and paint them. Be presentable. Their prohibition is against trying so very hard to look good in in all the ways that are so relatively unimportant. This becomes a real idol of the heart for a lot of people, a lot of Christians. The question asked specifically of women in these verses, and it clearly applies to men as well, is this. Will you grab people's attention with 
hair and jewelry and sexy, sexy clothes and tats or will your presence in the room be unmistakable because of your Christ-like character? What kind of signpost are you? Pointing to Him or pointing to me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity? Immodest dress tells the world, I'm not sure I've got anything more to offer than this. What you see is really all you get. But if the Bible is to be believed, this whole business of modesty is not irrelevant to Christian discipleship, biblical shepherding, biblical parenting, and grandparenting. Our bodies have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body, 1 Corinthians 6.20. That means we don't show everyone everything we might think is worth seeing. And it means we won't be embarrassed to keep most private those things that are most precious. You know, shame is a powerful biblical category and a category in our day because man is not ashamed of what he should be ashamed of. The key is knowing what things we should actually be ashamed of. Would you pray with me? Father, we understand that there is so much more Scripture's got to say about purity and the image we project to this age. We simply would pray that you would help your church to be an island of righteousness in this rank sea of paganism all around us. Help us to be the light that you've called us to be and you identified us with. Help us to be that city on a hill that points to Christ. Help us to have that salty preservative on our society. Because as the church goes, so goes the world. Use us to advance your fame, not our own. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen.